Hi, my name is Larissa Lamb. I'm the director of Far East Deep South. Hey, what's up? This is Baldwin Chu, AKA Only One, and you're listening to Rights and Shine with Phil M. Creative. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's time for another edition of Rise and Shine. So let's meet today's hosts. It's Ed and Ronnie. Rise and shine, party people. Phil, I'm Creative Fam. Shine. Good morning. Good How are you morning. doing, Ronnie? How am I doing? Well, um, I spent a long time this week thinking about some heavy stuff. I thought about some light stuff to even it out. And then I watched a movie that made me feel all the feels. So now I'm just doing, you know, my best. Um, I'm just doing my best here, Ed. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And I think I watched the same movie that you did uh, because I also had really good feelings about it, too. And I think that that's our guest for the week, our guests for this week. So I think we're on the same wavelength for that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I was I was having many, many moments of just like clarity and many moments of just lots of uh, lots of emotion in there. But I like the place where I ended up and we're, we're ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I, I couldn't agree more, you know, and as a lot of our viewers know, I, I grew up in Dallas and I went to school in New Orleans, so I know a lot of that area. And so it was a really uh, great experience to watch that and to see. Uh, well, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about that in the coming minutes. Um, and really, it's befitting that um, that Larissa and Baldwin are going to be our guests today because we are coming in on the tail end here of AAPI month. And uh, I know that Philam Creative has been doing a lot for uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, but we've also had some great programming this month for AAPI. And uh, like I know that a couple of weeks ago on the 12th, we did that great screening for uh, uh, the movie. And we are excited to have uh, the producers as our guests today. Uh, Ronnie, how has um, mental health awareness gone from your end as our executive director? Wow. Um, it's been it's been quite a ride even before the month kicked off. Um, you know, shout out to all the organizers out there, uh, especially volunteer organizers such as myself. Phil, I'm creative. If you want to drop us a donation, you can. We're on Venmo. Always be plugging. Um, yep. and no, it's uh, it's one of those things where, you know, you you t ask yourself, like, what? how much do I love this thing and how much do I want to make a difference in my community? And if it's like, how much are you willing to do it for for put in long hours and work really hard on it um, just really for the, for, to uplift everybody. And that's, I think the question that happens during ironically through mental health month and then nestling that into the intersection of mental health in the AAPI community. Woo. We got some, we got some stuff. We got some baggage uh, also to further put us in the more intersection. Um, you know, I'll, um, my e-board, we're all women. So we have, we have that not to deal with, but we also have that identity. We are, uh, yeah, AAPI women. We are, you know, I myself is part of the LGBTQIA community. It's like so many layers. And then you just kind of have to come up for air once in a while, but it's refreshing because you know, you're making a real difference. And I'm already, I'm already starting. I'm already starting, Ed. I've never, I've been to New Orleans once. So I, the best I can offer you today is my best Southern Belle impression of getting well, the only vapors. One time, I feel like, I feel like we need to correct that and take Rise and Shine on the road and uh, go to New Orleans. That, that would be my pleasure. So I am ready. The last time I was in New Orleans, I went to this awesome restaurant that had like 50 cent oysters for happy hour. And I took down two and a half dozen by myself. It's like, I ate all the oysters in the Gulf. I, they were going to save two for breeding, but I ate those two. So, <laughs> and our, uh, our production guy, Jeremiah is saying, yes, we should be traveling for these episodes. <laughs> well, hopefully if everyone keeps wearing those masks and gets vaccinated, we'll be able to travel more soon and bring rise and shine on the road. Although I do think our first stop is going to be uh, in the Bay area because Jeremiah, Yay, uh, area. we're doing a housewarming party at Jeremiah's place. Uh, I don't think he knows that yet, but anyway yes um, oh yes and then uh jeremiah is putting in our chat i did i had to bust this out for you um i got this engraved when uh mm. hella that's my little homage while i while i stick hella it out good. down here in la yes and and also for all of our bay area natives out there there's also degrees on which you say hella because you can say there's hella traffic but if there's hella traffic you know that you'll be in the car for a minute so <laughs> 
language is a funny thing, right? So is um, it is and language and roots and where we come from. Do you like my segue, Ed? <laughs> I like it. I like it. You know, before we get to our guests, uh, we do want to give a loving shout out to our brother Rex, because we know that some of you are watching right now and you're saying, wait a minute, where's Rex? Why are we looking at Ronnie and Ed? Why are, we let, why are we not looking at Rex and Ed? And the reason for that is because our brother Rex is currently receiving run off his with second a model. shot. He's getting no. his second shot. How about that? He didn't so, run uh, off with a model to exactly. the Caribbean. He's receiving <laughs> his second shot. Thank you for keeping us all safe, Rex. Yes. So just a friendly uh, reminder to everyone. Don't forget, wear your mask, get vaccinated. We love to see you. We'd love to shoot Rise and Shine season two in person. Although Zoom is certainly a cost-effective thing for us, but uh, and also a shout out to our wonderful Kami, who you're going to be seeing uh, in a few minutes. She couldn't be with us for today, but uh, she's going to be popping in from time to time. Maybe we'll see Veronica a little bit later too. I don't know, Ron Ronnie. You, you you don't want to see Veronica? You know, we I, I for for Mental Health Awareness Month, I think uh, I think we got the cue to keep uh, keep our distance away from each other. <laughs> So. All right. Well, you know what? Maybe we'll see her. Maybe not. We don't know. But anyway, um, once again, as uh, Ronnie said, feel free. This is just a little plug. But if you like the wonderful programming that Phil I'm Creative is doing for you, like Rise and Shine, like Women's History Month we did a few months ago, like Mental Health Awareness Month that we're doing this month, please consider dropping a few quid to our Venmo, which is at Philam Creative, at Philam Creative. Please consider doing that. But without further ado, we want to bring out our guests for today. Uh, we're going to start with the writer, director, producer of a great film that I know a lot of you watched with us on the 12th. And I know a lot of you have been streaming on PBS World all month through June 3rd. So if you haven't watched it yet, what's the matter with you? You've got till yes. June 3rd. Uh, get your device and stream this great film called Far East, Deep South. We are so honored today, especially since it's AAPI month, to have the writer, director, producer as our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Larissa Lamb. Good morning. Woo! Thank you for having me. Good to be here with you guys. We are honored to have you. And um, th this is... It, you know, Ronnie and I watched the movie uh, last month for the first time, yeah. and we were just really um, touched by it. And may maybe before we get too deep into it, for our viewers who haven't seen it yet, again, what's the matter with you? But for <laughs> our viewers who haven't seen it yet, Larissa, could you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what Far East Deep South is about? Well, Far East Deep South is uh, a search for a family's roots that happens to be my husband, Baldwin Chu's family, Chinese American family from California, goes to Mississippi in search of their roots. And they ended up uncovering not just more about their family, but they ended up uncovering the whole little known history of the Chinese in the segregated South and also the impact, impact of the Chinese Exclusion Act on their family. So uh, it's a lot of discoveries, a lot of surprises, and a lot of things we didn't learn in school. Ooh, that's the best yeah. way to put it. A lot of things we did not learn in school. And and as a teacher, as some of as some of our viewers know, my day job, I'm in a classroom. And yeah, I mean, definitely a, a lot of I'm a math teacher, but a lot of the things I learned while watching uh your film, the 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 Chinese Exclusion Act, um, we don't we I didn't learn that. And I went to school in the South, and uh that's not in the history books. And I know we were talking before um before we went on air, uh, it wasn't even repealed until, what was it, 1943? Yeah, it was not repealed until 1943 because during World War II, China was needed as an ally. So they didn't even repeal it on the grounds that it was just wrong. It was just like, you know, China might be a helpful ally. You might want to get rid of this little repeal, this law, so to speak. Mm. And then by repealing, they said, OK, now you can become citizens, but we're only going to let 105 of you into the country. You know, we're going to put a quota. So it's like they repealed it, but didn't repeal it completely. So it wasn't until 1965 with the passage of the National Nationality and Immigration and Nationality Act that the full effects um, of the immigration uh, restrictions of the Exclusion Act were kind of taken away. And just like thinking about that timeline, like 1965 was not that long ago, everybody. Yeah, not that it, long it was ago. in our parents' lifetime. <laughs> yes. Oh, exactly. yeah. 
And that's no. probably why a lot of our parents were able, like those of us who are maybe uh, the, the first ones born in this country or, you know, came over when we were really young, like that's why they were able to come in because 1965 was kind of the, the reason why they started letting more Asian immigrants in. Oh, yes. Yes. I think my grandmother actually uh, was able to come over here, um, but it was like a slow process. So we myself, I, I actually I wasn't born here. I, just, I feel so weird having to like say that <laughs> uh, I wasn't born here. So when I finally got here, it was the 80s. And um, yeah, it's like it took us that long. Like grandma came over probably shortly after that. And then everybody else followed and like took us like straight up 20 years or something like that. So uh, it's crazy to think how much you don't think you're involved with history, but then you are, and you are a history. And this film, I think, really explores that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all our family stories, like just what you described, like that makes up history. It, like history is just a series of stories, right? And we often forget that it's families that are involved with this history. And we just think about like the government or like wars or something, but you know, history is all of us. Exactly. Now, I know that you and your husband have a background in music. And so maybe if you could tell, share with our viewers a little bit of background on how you came to decide to shoot a documentary about this, this wonderful story. Yeah, well, I worked in the music industry. I should say I still work in the music industry. Um, I've worked in it for like 20 years and I've been a you know, recording artist, uh, still am a recording She's artist. really good guy. And you know oh, Rex. Thanks. And I know Rex and he's a fellow Bruin. Um, and you know, he does music publishing and, you know, uh, but he's, yeah, he's great. Uh, and I was, I'm an artist. I'm a, I wrote music for the Oprah Winfrey show. I've done, you know, all the stuff on the music side. And so initially after we went to the trip um, to Mississippi, I mean, I was really just like, I was just a passenger in the van. There's like a scene in our movie where we're like driving down to Mississippi and I'm actually like sleeping in the background. <laughs> I, was I was trying still, to find you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm like, I'm taking care of my daughter. So my, my myself and my sister-in-law, we were like in the back, right? Like we were in the back, get out of our way. My husband said, and like, just let our do us do our family thing and then as things started unfold as people will see if you've seen the movie you'll see you know what I mean if you haven't seen the movie you'll have to check it out but things started happening and I'm like why is there a Chinese museum in the middle of Mississippi wait a second how come we didn't learn about how Jim Crow laws impacted the Asian community too hold up why did we find a significant book? I won't spoil that, like in the middle of a museum. And like, where did these people come out of the woodwork who knew my fa my husband's family? So things just started happening. I'm like, I, I feel like more people need to know what's going on here. So, um, you know, we did a short film called Finding Cleveland about five years ago. And um, I was just the music composer at first. And then later on, I ended up directing because I didn't nice. really like what my husband and our editor did. So... <laughs> Good, uh -oh. good. You introduced you interjected there. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I had directed some. I had written and directed some plays like back in the day, so it wasn't completely foreign for me to be directing. But um, I had no I, intentions of being a documentary director, and so we did the short. It was well received. We ended up expanding it to Far East, Deep South, because there was so much more to explore. People kept asking us questions like, "How did how did your grandfather get there, Baldwin? And how did this happen?" And we're like, "We just went one trip. We have no idea." Yeah, we were just happy with one trip and never thought we'd like explore all this history for like the next five years. <laughs> so when you so when you went, you didn't initially think of even making this into the feature documentary. It was just for. No, um, it was it was we were just trying to find a gravesite. I mean, we had a photo of Baldwin's grandfather and great grandfather's gravesite. My father-in-law, for people who haven't seen the movie, he grew up without a father in China. It's kind of complicated why he was abandoned he thought he was abandoned by his father which is why we made the movie and we went to mississippi just to pay your respects and yeah. we didn't even know where the we didn't know where the cemetery was my, my brother-in-law just literally thought we'll just drive around and there can't be that many cemeteries <laughs> we knew the city we knew it was cleveland mississippi he's like well, we just drive around we'll, we'll find it eventually right if it takes us a couple days we'll, we'll find it eventually yeah um, and lo and behold, he called City Hall, and they're the ones who found, found this, told us what the cemetery was and told us about the Mississippi Delta Chinese Heritage Museum, which you see in our film. And, you know, we, we had no idea we would uncover all this history personally and, you know, on a larger scale. How, how helpful was the community uh, when you went there? Were they, I mean, were they forthcoming? Were they helpful? Were they like, why are you here? What do you want? Like, what, what was the relationship you developed with the local uh, townsfolk? 
Yeah, what's interesting, I mean, you know, I live in L and I, LA and I grew up in the LA area. So we're talking big city, right? So we don't think to like call City Hall, like my brother-in-law called City Hall and somebody actually answered and, and called him back and helped him. No recording? <laughs> no press zero? No, I know. He didn't have to like fill out five gajillion forms on the internet to like get to somebody. I mean, it, it, it was kind of miraculous in the way. I think he had actually called a couple months prior to our trip, but he, and he didn't, I mean, they didn't call him back like right away, but they did call him back, I think like the week before our trip. And so it, it, even if he, they didn't call back. We were just, we were still planning. We had already booked our tickets. We were still going to go. Um, and once we got there, I mean, there's something to Southern hospitality, you know, um, I don't know what you experienced growing up there, Ed, but like people are just nicer. Yes. I know they, I know the South gets a bad rap about, you know, being really racist and all those things. But like, honestly, when we went there, we weren't even like considered the Chinese family, I think, because they were used to seeing Chinese in the yeah. Mississippi Delta. They actually called us the Californians. They thought it was strange that we were from California. So everywhere we went, they're like, there's a family from California trying to find out information about their family. And that to me was actually a little, I don't want to say jarring, but like that was a surprise, you know, because I think sometimes we define, are always defined by our ethnicity, right? As like, oh, there's the Chinese family, but like we were defined by our statehood. <laughs> That's That's amazing. Great. Yeah. And they were just, ha they were so happy, especially when we told them the story and we were showing them the picture of the gray side, like everybody was like, oh, let me see if I know somebody. And, you know, that's why City Hall's like, oh, try the museum. And then Emily Jones, who you meet in the film, you know, she, you know, she started like calling people and posting, you know, on Facebook, like, hey, anybody know who this she family is? She seemed like is? a very helpful, she comes oh. across on the screen as such a helpful person. Oh my gosh. She's okay. awesome. It, I have to I have to know this like it feels like when you when you came in um, grandpa I kept calling him grandpa but uh, Baldwin's, uh, Baldwin's, Baldwin's dad. dad yeah Baldwin's dad. grandpa is over here I feel like when we, you guys were at home and you're trying to pitch this like let's go to this trip we're gonna talk to this lady grandpa's at home being like I don't want to talk to this lady but there's so <laughs> much but then when you get there he's just right at Emily's side showing her pictures giving yeah. him this meal that's like that's grandpa's bestie all of a sudden <laughs> yeah you know what's you know what's funny is he like uh, later on when I went to look at some of the footage and, and like I said, I was taking care of my daughter. So like every once in a while, you'll see me like in the background. <laughs> she was but, little. She was a baby. Uh, she, was ba she was little. And so when I would when I reviewed the footage that my husband and my brother in law were taking and, and half the time it was like on cell phones, the first trip at least, um, I, I'm like, he's like totally pouring out his heart to her. I'm like, he never shared any of this with like my husband and his and, you know, his brother. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, complete stranger. <laughs> and he's like telling his like family story what happened and like mm -hmm. what he knows and what he doesn't know and it was just really interesting and Emily is super sweet and she's become a very very good friend um, and here's just a tip like even with the National Archives which we go to later in in our film um, the people that are there they're archivists and people that are librarians and uh, keepers of history they actually love it when people like us go and like want to find stuff because they're like that's why we do all this stuff they're they're professional hoarders and now finally people care about the stuff they hoard <laughs> I no, it, it you know, and I'm so glad that you that you said that because you know I think I think that you know pop culturally speaking, media wise, we're so I mean I, I have a communications degree, I have a film degree, and I'm I'm very biased about how how biased our media is. You know, it, it it's everything is New York. Every if it's not if it didn't happen on the East Coast, maybe L.A. will get a nugget. But you know, I mean, we're very. The, our whole society has grown up on this East Coast, New York centric baloney uh, attitude. And so, you know, watching your film and looking at Chinese people in the South, you know, especially moving out to a bigger city in LA, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, there's Asians who live in the South too. There's, you know, it's not just, it's not just Southern people in, in the South, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a wide variety there. So, I mean, I think your film, uh, did a great job of bringing to light that, you know, the Asian communities everywhere. It's not just in the big cities, you know, it's even in Mississippi, it's even in the South. Mm -hmm. Now yeah, we just got to go find those Asians in middle America because yeah. I feel like that's always the, but middle America won't get this. But yes. they're there. I mean, that, and that's, the, 
And that's the thing about, you know, when we went and did this research, you know, we realized like the Chinese didn't just show up in like California and then disappeared after they came, you know, just like Filipinos didn't just show up in America and then disappear, you know, um, it's like Japanese the same way. It's like we, we didn't show up to build railroads and then like show up to like get incarcerated during, you know, World War II for Japanese, right? Like, like that's how our history books portray us, right? Exactly. Like that's, that, but that's not the truth. And even in middle America, I mean, we went to Cleveland, Ohio, Cleveland, <laughs> where Ohio. Um, when our first film was called Finding Cleveland. So they were very confused because we were talking about Cleveland, Mississippi. And we're like, no, this is not about you. You know, and there's, I mean, there's Asians <laughs> in the Midwest. <laughs> yep. You know, there's certain rural areas that you may not find it, but a lot of like Midwestern cities, like I have a cousin in St. Paul and, you know, like Minnesota and like, you know, there's there's people everywhere that are of Asian descent. It's just they're not portrayed, Ed, like you said, in media, in, in the news or even in film and TV. And that's why, you know, they just think we exist in vacuums. Yes, yes. Let's change now, that, shall we? Exactly. Let's change that. There's so many more stories beyond the South that we'd like to tell. Exactly. <laughs> now, I know I know that uh, we've got your husband Baldwin coming out in a minute. Uh, one more thing that uh, before we bring him out, uh, you know, a lot of uh, and, and congratulations that the film is a big success on PBS. So maybe you could share uh, with our viewers, how did PBS get involved in uh, how, how did that uh, deal that connection happen? Well, I have to give a shout out to the Asian American Documentary Network um, that I'm a member of um, because they did a, a workshop about a year ago and, and uh, you know, where we got to meet some of the, the key people um, at the different PBS um, programs. And we had always had people, like whenever they saw early cuts of our movie, like, oh, this would be perfect for PBS. And then you're also thinking like, well, how do I get it on PBS, <laughs> right? Yeah, tell me more. Um, <laughs> and they do have a submission process, but certainly networking with some of the people um, at PBS, I mean, we did go through the submission process. Um, you know, we ended up submitting to America Reframed, um, which is the program um, that our film is being um, shown on and is being streamed right now. Uh, that's part of the PBS family. And it was, it, you know, America Reframed just by the definition of the show, the series, like makes sense for our film because we are really trying to reframe what people think sure. as, as an American or even what they perceive as like an Asian American experience. Um, so they were a, a great partner, um, even though we had offers from other people, but we really felt because education was such an important part of you know, our campaign and impact um, that we really want to broaden the way American history is told so that when people are talking about the segregated South, um, that now we can include, yeah, well, Asians were impacted too. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that we're part of that story. Um, so PBS is kind of the gold standard for, for education still. So that's how we kind of came to, to be with World Channel America Reframed. And we're so grateful for the support they've given us. And there, there's also several other films being shown in May, if you catch it while you can, um, during AAPI Heritage Month. Rise and shine. This is Kami. I hope you're enjoying the show. Did you know we have a mailing list? And did you know that you can contact us if you want to say hello to Ed, Rex, Ronnie, Veronica, or even me, just send us an email at riseandshinefac. That's one word spelled out, riseandshinefac at gmail.com. Again, that's riseandshinefac, all spelled out, at gmail.com. Join our mailing list so you can be the first to find out about the latest Rise and Shine news. We know that uh, we have another producer who we're so happy to bring out as another guest. And Larissa, I know you know him. Uh, so Just a I little, just bring, a little. Just a little bit, exactly. He now shows he, up at the house sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's now good he, for babysitting. <laughs> mm, noted. Now he's also a rapper and we might get him to a uh, beatbox for us a little bit later, but I know we're going to focus on the film for today, but we want to bring out uh, one of the stars of the documentary. Let's bring out Baldwin Chu. Baldwin, good morning. Hey, hey, hey. What's up, what's up? Come on, give me a... <laughs> <laughs> oh, love it. That's my alarm. That's my alarm clock every morning. 
You're so <laughs> lucky. <laughs> oh my gosh. Amazing. Amazing. Well, shout out to uh, Bay Area hip hop artists um, uh, uh, all over because uh, yeah. that, was, that was fire. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> we're we're going to have to have you back for another episode to talk about music. You you oh. too, Larissa. We'll, yes. It, it'll be another Rex episode. It's the to whole that. topic in itself. <laughs> yeah, Rex is going to exactly. be so mad if we, he Rex wasn't on the music. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think what we could do, Ronnie, is you and I will take that week off and then Kami and Rex can do that show. <laughs> they can geek out and, and talk exactly. about the music stuff and i'll just be in the back vibing just exactly yeah people call us the asian jay-z and beyonce but we like to call <laughs> we like to call them the the african-american larissa and only one <laughs> yeah i'm gonna start saying that too yeah. queen bay yeah yeah because i mean yeah. we got married first and then they decided to get married right <laughs> and then we did like a song together and then they decided to do a song together you guys right. had a daughter. She's and then they got older a daughter. And, then right? Ivy Carter. The parallels yeah. are just. But then they decided old. to have more kids, and then and they had more kids, and we're like, oh, we're not. This is not a <laughs> yeah, competition. Yeah, we're like, we're out. <laughs> we're like, you're done. Wow. Okay, you've got more movies to make. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic. Now, well, Baldwin, welcome to the show. We're happy to have you, and you know, I, I mean, I, you know, honestly, the the first question I really want to ask you is. Um, and again, it's kind of a spoiler, but not really. But I hope what it does is it gets our viewers interested in watching the film. If you haven't, what's the matter with you? But um, Baldwin, please, please talk about uh, what was the process of you and Larissa getting your father involved in the film? Was he was he reluctant? Was he excited about it? Like, I really enjoyed watching his reactions and just his story. I mean, it's it's a beautiful story, but talk about what it was like to get him uh, to be part, to be the subject of this, of this great film. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's definitely evolved since the beginning of this process. Um, and Larissa likes to tell this part of the story because I tried so hard to finally try to get information from him. And like Larissa's like, all right, let me try it. Cause, cause he wasn't answering me. Like he, he'd give me these one, one word answers or one sentence answers and, and just kind of blow me off. And then uh, Larissa was like, okay, just, just get out of here. Just let me take care of it. So all, if you, if you watch the film, right, all those interviews that you see with my dad, I was not there. And, and I did not know any of those stories like um, that, that you guys saw in the film. I didn't know any of those stories until we got back home and I was going through playback on all the video and, and audio. And I was like, what? I didn't know anything oh about this growing up. And he just spilled his guts to you. <laughs> Um, for those who don't know, like an immigrant dad, a PSD immigrant dad, they have immigrant parents, they have secrets. And I think it was, a, they, <laughs> uh, what was it? Hassan Minhaj, another uh, Sac Davis local comedian, he, uh, he puts in his special that immigrant parents, like they be having secrets. Like yes. you won't know this. And the thing, and they won't ever tell you. So Baldwin, you were saying that like, like your whole, you know, probably like a big chunk of your life, you're trying to like learn more about this stuff from your dad and, and dad's over here. Like, yeah, it was cool. <laughs> like, like one word it was, answer. Yeah. It was yeah. actually, it would be like, there's nothing to talk about. It's just there's like, I don't nothing know. to talk about. Know. Yeah. <laughs> when, when your father made the, I, I was literally cracking up and I was thinking about my own parents, shout out to my mom and dad. When I your dad you. <laughs> made the, I, I, I'm trying to remember what part of the movie it was in, but he was talking about how, well, you know, we don't really want to talk to you about this because you're interested in music and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and all these, and, they, and I'm and just thinking put that's it against my childhood. You. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're veering it, into mental health right now. Yeah. And our parents try to put it against us. They think we're not interested, but we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. They don't want to listen. It's like, well, maybe, but we really do. And especially as we get older, we really do want to listen. And uh, yeah. maybe you just don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That's what your mom called. Exactly. Uh, you, Baldwin's mom called out his dad. In that she did. Situation. And that cracked that me up. Like, you just don't want to talk about it. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. You should have your told fault for not dad. educating your kids. I was like, tell right? them, tell them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there is, there is some more to that scene, but it, 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 it got heated. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can, I think you cut it short just to keep it funny. <laughs> One of the things that really, you know, that that whole exchange that we're talking about right now, you know, I my my I have a cousin. Shout out to my cousin Zig, and we talk a lot about how you know immigrant parents, you know, they're they're so focused on their children, they're focused on getting here, they're focused on their children getting an education and being success a success, and that's their narrative. And so when you talk to them about their own background, it's almost like they don't find themselves interesting. 
and you know watching the the dialogue the interaction between your family i was thinking about my own family i'm guessing ronnie might have some uh, feelings on her own family too. Oh, that, I, I completely you know, just adopted yeah. myself into your family. I was like, Grandpa, I was like, Louisa, you want me to take the baby while you go film this? Like, I, I would like appreciate like, that. I, I was, I felt like I was in the van with you guys. I mean, they, you know, it, it's almost like they feel like they don't have this interesting story, and yet it's like, in in your case, Baldwin, you can say, Dad, what the hell are you talking about? We just made a film about your damn story that you don't think is interesting. And, and, and yet all our, our immigrants and not just Asian Americans, but, and, you know, but like, you know, I think all of our immigrant parents have a great story to tell. And so Baldwin, uh, just talk about what it was like for you as the son, because obviously you too got to learn a lot about your dad. So what was that like for you? Well, I mean, what you're saying is, is great because I think what it, um, what, what our parents and immigrant families are wanting is acceptance, right? And so they knew that they weren't accepted when they came over. So they're thinking, well, the path to acceptance is education and success, right? But if you look at today's climate, it still doesn't garner acceptance necessarily, right? right. And so I think throughout this process, we were thinking, well, then how do we get accepted? I grew up not sure, you know, if I was American or if I was Chinese. And if I was American, well, then I can only be American to one group of people, but I can't be American to another group of people. Same thing with being Chinese. Mm. And so what is the cause of us not feeling accepted or belonging uh, in this country? And I really think that it comes down to people's knowledge and everyone's understanding of what our history is. If people understood that we've been here for so long. I mean, Filipinos, like I, I didn't know until after we made our short film, one of my closest um, high school or actually elementary friends is Filipina. And she was like, hey, you know, we, we got here in like 1587, like in Morrill Bay. I'm just like, what? You're like, yeah, we beat you. <laughs> right? I'm just like, well, that's cool. I'm not, it's not a competition. Then I started researching it, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, why don't we know about that? And so I feel like, you know, we really need to make this movie, not, not for me, not for my dad, not even for my daughter, which was the original intent, right? This movie is really for everyone to understand how American we really are. And if we can be accepted by that, then people wouldn't, you know, this whole anti-Asian American thing, it's really just anti-American. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they don't see us as American. But if they understood that we were American, I, I think that it would it would change a lot. Oh, my gosh. So yeah. much truth. Thank you. And, and I would you. just jump in for for anyone who is 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 saying like, but we shouldn't be assimilating to the standards of white America. Our point isn't that we need to change. We're trying to change the people who view us right as not american like we can still be filipino and american at the same time we can be chinese heritage and american that intersection, at the same time. Girl, that right, intersection. just as the same so we got italian friends italian americans and irish american friends that are proud of their heritage but yet they're fully accepted as american in this country so that's kind of what we're talking about being american isn't us assimilating it's like the rest of the country you know getting on board with viewing us that way yeah, we shouldn't have to choose like, oh, I can be American now and I can be ethnic later, right? We can just be both all the time, right? Why can't we be both all the time and and celebrate that? I 100% agree. Like, let's, it, yeah, anti-American, like this, I don't want to spoil like most of the, most of it. Like I'm not, like, but for those who have seen uh, Far East Deep South already, it's like, that's really what it all comes down to. Like, this is an American story. A story about an American family, and though the the line may not be you know super linear, there's a lot of back and forth, and there's other countries involved. It's still about an American family. People who were no more spoilers. Oh my gosh, let's and stop me and stop me. <laughs> no, you know you you're you're absolutely right, Ronnie. And you know I, I have a unique perspective because I am in education, and we're at we're at such a crossroads right now in in education. There's an argument over what needs to be taught. There's an argument over changing of the curriculum. Well, that's exactly why we need education, right? That's why education is number one, our priority. So uh, university schools, uh, they have first dibs at our film. Uh, we, we signed with educational distributor New Day Films, which is 100% education. So like if you're in a university system and you have Canopy, you know, Canopy with a K, um, that's like the top uh, streaming platform for universities and colleges. Um, our film is available on Canopy. You can also license through uh, New Day Films for your um, high school, junior high. High school is, is where we recommend the, the film at, junior high and, and end up. 
So I was gonna say they need to teach. They need to teach. They need to show this. This needs to be like required viewing. And yeah, I, so I work with middle school students, and I can say, or junior high, and I would, I could say for sure that they would enjoy watching the film. Absolutely. Yeah, and and that's our whole hope is that we all learn American history. I know there's a debate about ethnic studies and Asian American studies. We're like, this is American history that we're talking about in our film. Like, we're not saying you need to add an extra chapter. We're saying you just need to broaden what you're yes. already teaching, so that it's more. Inclusive, and you see more of the whole picture of who has been involved in those chapters of American history. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I, I've, I've heard students say, like, and even teachers, history teachers, they're like, man, how many years do we got to teach about the Civil War? Can we teach about something else? I mean, we already taught yeah. that in sixth grade and seventh grade, and it, there, there's got to be more than the Civil War, right? Or slavery. Like, you know, I've had, I've had black history professors and black friends who are like, why do we keep on teaching about slavery? We, we've, <laughs> we've learned about it for so long. Let's let's learn about other parts of our history, right? And so I mean, you need to learn about those. You not do, but we don't you don't need to learn, learn yeah. about it like sure. every year, and that's the only thing you learn about, right? And there's it there's stops space, right there, right? And, and and a lot of times we want to say, you know, people say like, well, history is so expansive. How can you fit all this history? Well, then stop repeating, teaching the same things and keep starting new things. And actually, Dr. Robert Voss um, in our film, he's our white professor, right? He's our token white guy, right? <laughs> he's, he's he's my friend. He's, he's, he's my friend. We, we grew up together and he actually never knew my history. And he ended up being an American history professor, right? And so I was talking to him the other day and he's learning about our history and he's like, I'm putting this in our American history class because this is not, we don't have Asian AM studies and this doesn't need to go to Asian AM studies in our university, if, even if we had it. It needs to go in our American history program. So he added it to their class, right? But he told me, he's like, you know, him being white, he was like, us white people are, are afraid of cancel culture, right? Because everyone's talking yeah. about canceling, right? And he's like, and I was like, we're not here to cancel you guys. We're here to add, right? There's not a zero sum game. And he's like, yes. And he was like, as historians, this is our problem. Um, people think that history belongs to a certain group of people. And he was like, us as white people have to understand, even though we wrote most of the history books, history doesn't belong to us. So it's not just up to us to tell history, right? Especially as a history professor and as a historian, it's a, it, it's, it, it ruins the whole you know, their name as historians. And he goes like, likewise, now that you learned about your history here in America, this history doesn't belong to you. And it also doesn't belong to the black community. History just is, and it's all of us, right? And so for us as historians to not tell the full picture, it prevents us, as I would say, it prevents us from understanding what got us to where we are today. And if you don't know what got us here, then how can you go create a better future? You know, exactly. so I, I added to what he was saying. And so, you know, we had this really deep conversation about like, you know, it's not a zero sum game. Adding additional history does not diminish somebody else's history nor nor take their history away. And so we actually started a, a, a fund called the First Class Initiative, um, where um, if there are schools that are underfunded and don't have the budget to afford the license to bring it into the classroom. Um, we, we can, people can come to us and possibly tap into our fund that we could get, get a copy donated um, or licensed um, to their school. And if you're interested in supporting our efforts of what we're doing, um, we are also um, working with a, a nonprofit and um, you can make a tax deductible donation to the first class initiative fund um, that we're doing and on our website, fareastdeepsouth.com. And we don't don't have our DVD available for individual use yet, like home video, so to speak, it, eventually. But if you do donate to our, our first class initiative, um, we will actually get a free DVD and a poster signed um, and one of my old school CDs <laughs> with nice. a song from with my song from my from the film. Um, so. Yes. Baldwin pointed out earlier that you were supposed to originally be the composer for the film. I was. Um, well, for the short film, I did do the music, um, Finding Cleveland. And then when we came up to do uh, the feature length, um, being the director, producer, and writer, there was a lot of hats I was wearing already and music supervisor. I had the good sense to tap my good friend, Nathan Wong, who is a world-class composer. The man has won Emmy Awards. Um, he has written music with Hans Zimmer for like Kung Fu Panda. He's worked on every Jackie Chan movie in the last like 10, 15 years. His he actually wrote the music. If you guys follow International Box Office, so earlier this year, um, there's a movie that came out called Detective Chinatown 3 that actually busted Avengers Endgame's like domestic record. And Nathan wrote the music to that, to that movie. Yes. 
and and he worked on our film like right after that. So like, I'm so grateful for having such an incredible like composer on our, and Epson Wu, our assistant composer was fantastic to work with too. One of the things uh, I want to backtrack to something that Baldwin mentioned that, you know, we, earlier I was asking about his father's reaction and he had said that, um, you know, that originally you had, you had wanted to do this for your daughter. So maybe you as parents could talk about what is, first of all, how old is your daughter now? And what has been her reaction? Like, has she, I mean, obviously she's seen the film, but like, what does she think? I mean, obviously it's mom and dad's job. It's their project. But like, what do you think she's learned from this? Oh man. Well, you saw her in the movie with my dad holding her as a baby. Now she's seven turning eight. She's seven and three quarters. Uh, And (laughs) And she is actually a little historian. She, her favorite Great. books to read are biographies, even though they're kids books that are drawn, you know, like she's, she's on her, like on the, on my laptop, on her digital library, looking up biographies of historical people and even new people. And he just, she just loves reading about people. She just thinks everybody, no matter what color you are and how far in time or how recent in time, she's like, wow, these people are so amazing. So she just loves she she loves history and we we want to make sure that she doesn't grow up having the same questions that were asked to us and to my father and to our great grandparents right and all those things that made us feel um like we don't belong here um we want her to know how american she is and she, but yet she goes to a chinese immersion school so so she's learning our language um our, our native language uh, but but she's she's 100% understands her Americanness. She's she's so proud, and she'll she'll straight up tell people, you know. So we're really we're we're glad she's on that path, and and we hope we can keep on encouraging that. I'm excited. She's probably gonna uh, be our boss one day, or my boss one day. <laughs> well, you know, you know, you know what's interesting is like as we were kind of talking through things or showing her historical videos and cartoons. Like I remember there was this one cartoon we saw that were about the presidents of the United States, right? And she actually asked, and this is before Kamala was elected for vice president, and even then, that's not president yet, right? And she's like, "Are women allowed to be president?" That's what she actually said, because she, you know, you don't see it, right? Valid and then question. She, right, and she didn't make the next leap. Was like, are Asians allowed to be, you know, president? Because, I mean, but those are the things. Is like children, like she sees, like, how come all these people don't look like me? <laughs> that's, that's why represent, representation does matter. Because I had a friend of mine who's not Asian. He was like, well, why does representation matter? Why don't you just do it? You don't need somebody to show you that it can be done. You need to just do it, right? And I'm like, no, sometimes you do need someone to show you. And because and because that's never been done before, it's that much harder for that one person to be like, I can do it. It's like, come on, it's just a state of mind. No one's ever stopped you, right? I'm just like, I know you might not have stopped me because my, my friend was like, I've always considered you an American. I never looked at you as the Chinese guy. And I was like, I know that, I know that. And you might not have done that for me. And you might have always believed in me being quarterback, you know, the football team or whatever. But the rest of the country has never believed in a Chinese person ever to become the quarterback of an NFL team because it still hasn't happened, right? Mm-mm. So representation does matter and, and and as larissa said like for my daughter she looks around kids are so observant right and it continues into our adulthood where like our impressions as a child we see how things go and we think that's the way it's supposed to go we don't see ourselves as part of the narrative and i think that's what we want with the film we want to normalize the narrative right normalize the understanding of our community that it is part of everything and that it's okay and normal for us to be seen elsewhere than what is stereotypically seen. Well, it's, and it, it's fascinating you brought that up because, you know, your, your father didn't grow up with a father. And you had, que- you had questions that you wanted to learn about your father, Baldwin. And so now we come full circle. And here is your daughter, Larissa and Baldwin. And your daughter is watching, you know, and, and also not just for Asian American and for cultural things, but also, you know, I mean, filmmaking is a director's medium. So here's a, here's a little girl who's watching her mom, who is, who is going to be making the film is the creator of the film. And so you're watching that the mom is the artist and the mom is the one creating this, this body of work. And I think, you know, that's something also that's very important for children to watch because as someone who works in education, you know, a lot of times the, the stereotype is that the dad 
is the one who goes and gets the job and makes the money and whatnot. And, I, and I'm sure that that's happening in both your cases here. But, I wonder you know, why, <laughs> I wonder why that Lisa, stereotype exists. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, when Chloe Zhao won the Oscar this year for mm-hmm. Nomadland Best Director, I mean, that was a watershed moment. I mean, she was only the second woman in 90 something years of the Oscars to win an Oscar. And I think she was only like the seventh or eighth woman to be nominated, period. Mm-hmm. And, exactly. you know, and, and Baldwin and I tell this story all the time. So we had a world premiere last year of our film Far East Deep South at the CineQuest um, Film Festival in San Jose. And it was we, a live theater. Remember it was those a days one, when you could yeah, go to it a was real movie theater. <laughs> the only time we got to do something live until everything shut down like two days later, literally. Wow. And we're on the red carpet, our last red carpet that we ever went on. And the reporter comes up to Baldwin and goes, So obviously you're the director of the film. Oh, seriously. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Ronnie. I was, I, I gave her the death stare, let me tell you. <laughs> Exactly. I gave her, and she was a woman of color. <laughs> She's a South Asian sister. And I was like, oh, no, you didn't. Oh, no, you just did it. And this <laughs> just is like, why since so we're going to start over, yeah. you cut the cameras real quick. Since we're about to start over, I'm going to let you know real quick. Do you the courtesy, letting you know I'm the director. We will, we, will, <laughs> we can delete that footage, but I just need to let you know. Oh, my God. Please continue. Yeah. And, and that's the problem is like, even, even us fellow women, like have that bias, right? So for our daughter, whether it's gender bias, racial bias, like these are all things that we're trying to address, like with our film. um, And that hopefully people will just have, uh, you know, not make those prejudgments. We all do it. So I mean, it's not like I'm saying I'm casting stones at somebody. I'm like, look, I'll fess up. I have in the past assumed somebody that looked Asian may not be from here. I've had to t- retrain my brain, even though yeah. I was born here. And maybe it's because my parents, my parents do speak with an accent. You know, um, Baldwin's dad does speak with an accent. Although if you see in the film, his lineage has, he's now the fifth generation in this country. Again, it's complicated. Watch the movie. But <laughs> they are, they've been in America for five generations. And now my daughter's the sixth generation. Um, and so it's all of us reorienting our brains to think differently of how we define things. Couldn't and it needs to more. happen. And it needs to happen. Absolutely. Um, we uh, are going to get to our final segment here, 13 Things and Close, but uh, it's important that we say it twice. We're going to ask again at the end, but we're going to ask it also here. Larissa, how can we watch this movie right now? Well, now until June 3rd, you can actually stream it on demand at pbs.org or worldchannel.org. Far East, Deep South, um, any time zone, any time of day, you can do that. And please share with your friends. Um, again, if you're the part of a university system that has a subscription to Canopy with the K, um, you can also watch Far East, Deep South on there. You actually get a slightly longer version on, Ooh, <laughs> on the university the college system. College cut. <laughs> yeah. And definitely go to our website, fareastdeepsouth.com. If you miss the boat and you're watching this, you know, past those deadlines, we're going to be part of several film festivals coming up as as well as we always have special screenings going on and we'll be making different announcements about our film and, and having it accessible in different parts of the year. So go to our website, fareastdeepsouth.com, subscribe to our newsletter. You can also follow us on social media at Far East Deep South on Instagram at Far East Deep So on Twitter because we ran out of letters because Twitter is like that, you know? <laughs> but also, also, I mean, like you have, you have listeners out here that are working for corporations and companies, especially if you're doing more diversity and inclusion um, events like that. Um, we are doing a lot more private events, uh, private screenings with companies, and they can be virtual or live, but right now it's all virtual. And those are really fun too, because you can have a smaller intimate moment and you can actually do it within the context of your company. You can apply it to how your company actually does hiring and how your company actually um, point, uh, promotes yeah. uh, unity and workplace happiness, right? And how to yeah. just really understand and get, get conversations going. So you know, um, call, uh, so uh, companies, uh, contact us, organizations. Uh, you can hit us up through our website, also fireysteepsouth.com. And uh, we're doing a lot more of those private events and doing screenings and you can bring us on to be speakers for a discussion. We are going to 13 things, our guests, filmmakers, producers, um, the star, Baldwin Chu is going to be on here, but most of our questions are going to be directed towards the director herself, (laughs) Larissa Lamb. All right. So 13 things. Um, May I please ask, starting with you, Larissa, to say your name and what your title is. Here we go. My name is Larissa Lamb, and I'm the director of Far East Deep South. Did I get that right? 
Yes, yes. I think so, yeah. I got one. I got one answer. Yes. <laughs> you need a, you need a, you need oh, wait, there's no, there's no prizes? I thought no, I was winning a car at the end of this. No? Sorry, we, we we can't do that. We don't have the budget for that. We pay Jeremiah too much. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Baldwin, right. <laughs> what is your, can you get, can we get your name and title one oh, time? Yes. All right. My name is Baldwin Chu and I'm the producer of Far East Deep South. Do you need a drum roll? Love it. We this can so use cool. these clips again, right? Like, oh. do you want to sign something? <laughs> I just, just All right. it's so good. Okay, cool. And then Jerry Bear, uh, we will have 13 seconds on the clock. It's really not going to be seconds, guys. Uh, but uh, here we go. Take All right, here again. we go. Let's get to know you guys a little bit. Uh, so, Larissa, you are a documentary filmmaker. Can you recommend for us uh, four documentaries or documentary filmmakers that inspired you to make this project? Uh, there are so many great documentary filmmakers, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout out a few of them. So Stanley Nelson, who is a, a longtime veteran um, black filmmaker, um, has done some amazing work. Um, I recently watched his Michael Vick documentary, which was really, really good. Um, I didn't think a documentary by Ma Michael Vick would be that good. Um, and the co-founders of the Asian American Documentary Network, shout out to Leo Chang and Grace Lee, who also have just a body of work. I don't want to just shout out one film because they've done so much. Um, um, and then Julia Reichert, who won an Oscar last year um, for American Factory, um, she's one of the founders of New Day Films, which is which is our distributor now. And so she's, again, legendary, has a huge body of work that people need to check out. I'm going to shout out Jimmy Chin, Free Solo. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, so if you were not a documentary filmmaker, and I know you're also involved in music, what would you want to do instead? I would be on Broadway hands down that would have been my dream is but because i was asian and this is pre-hamilton very few roles so i did not become a theater major was not on broadway <laughs> nfl quarterback hmm who uh i've got to throw aside here who's your favorite nfl quarterback joe montana who's your favorite current nfl oh current <laughs> no 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 either one but, but both uh, yeah current i'm gonna I, i'm gonna i'm gonna say russell wilson even though he's a seattle <sighs> seahawk but, we, um, Jeremiah, we might have to edit this because he did not say Aaron Rodgers. But oh, okay. oh no, I do like Aaron Rodgers too. Oh, I forgot. Yes, I should have said Aaron Rodgers too. Oh my gosh, we met. You met Aaron yeah, Rodgers. He sat behind me in church. I was like, <laughs> I, 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 seriously, I, I was like, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, and then I bumped oh, Larissa. I was like, my God. dude, I, I, I think that dude totally looks like Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> I feel like, like but, we should just stop the episode right now because yeah, like, I know. He's like my favorite. Oh Roll my credits. Gosh. I would have said Aaron Rodgers for sure if uh, if if we picked him if if our Niners picked him with the first pick, but we we didn't. So, anyways. all right. Well, I I think we need to keep going here. All right, keep going. Just, sorry, sorry, sorry. Totally we'll talk, got me now. We'll talk Rodgers. NFL all the time. Exactly. Go ahead. Exactly. Go ahead. Ooh, no all way. right. Uh, let's see. Oh well, that was a good seg because the next question is, what's your biggest distraction, <laughs> good or oh. bad, preventing you from accomplishing <laughs> anything? Is her daughter a valid answer? <laughs> oh, yes. I'm yeah. surprised she didn't run down here. <laughs> All right. Uh, I uh, mean, we love her, but, you know, she can be a distraction. I think that's the answer. In a good way. In a good way. In a good way. Okay. Uh, if you all could run a nonprofit, what type of cause would it benefit? There are so many uh, incredible causes. Um, I don't know. Baldwin, do you do, you, do you I, I thought you were going to say, like, save the penguins or something. I mean, I could say this. No, I, you know what? I... I a lot of causes that I, I have a heart for, um, but certainly my mom went through breast cancer um, a couple years ago, and so um, I would love to help cure cancer. I was just going to say, because Larissa is a huge Penguins fan, uh, Penguin fan, I would say save the penguins, but then my mine would be save the whales by feeding them penguins. Wow. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to work that out behind the scenes. <laughs> All right. Um, what is something peculiar that not a lot of people know about you? I love office supplies. I have an obsession with office supplies. Staples, oh, Office Depot. Do you collect washi tape, Larissa? Oh, do you know what washi, washi tape is? That It's like that that paper tape. It's like for like journaling, but it's all over yes, staples. Yes, I, I do have it. And it's only because I, like, I see like a penguin design, Baldwin Dimension, I like penguins. So I have a penguin one. <laughs> Um, so I do, I keep it for the sake of that, but I used to have like tons of paper and cardstock and vellum and yeah, staples is my jam. Do you, uh, do, I'm just curious, do you have colored staples? I don't have colored staples, but I do have colored paper clips. 
Oh, okay. And different okay. shapes too, including oh. penguins. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on. What is your favorite place in China, in Asia? Oh, Hong Kong for sure for me. Uh, Tokyo, actually, I don't, I don't like all the Chinese countries that much. <laughs> so, oh, like, I'm a creator to my culture. I'm like, I don't like China. I don't like Hong Kong. I don't, I, you know, I, I go to Hong Kong just for the dim sum. Well, That's I guess it. Hong Kong is, yeah, technically Hong Kong's part of China, but you know, now, but I, yeah, I'm just not. not I can relate that. to that, Larissa. I'm Filipino and I love Japan. But, uh, yeah. Uh, what is the most beautiful place you all have ever seen? The Great Barrier Reef. In the when water, I, snorkeling, yes. When I stare into Larissa's eyes. Oh. Good answer. <laughs> we could end it right there. <laughs> That's a man right Especially there. Especially through I'm Zoom. I'm happy to repeat that to my dude. Okay. Hey, stick your eye in the camera. Let me take a look. <laughs> okay, I'm so going gonna to give you both some locations and tell us what you like to do the most in those locations. All right, outdoors. Breathe. <laughs> I was gonna say snowboarding. Okay, in your living room. Uh, watch TV. Just sitting on the sofa. When you're in Asia. Eating dim sum. Seeing relatives and friends. When you're on a vacation. Chilling, hopefully doing nothing. <laughs> exactly, doing absolutely nothing. When you're online. Oh. Checking in social media, seeing what my friends are up to. Yeah, just email. Okay, now usually we only ask this question to one person, so we got to keep it a little clean here. In your bedroom. <laughs> yeah, see. Sleep. It's a really <laughs> boring answer, but oh, sleep. Uh, anything not rated PG. <laughs> what? <All right. laughs> these are these are conflicting answers. You guys are gonna have to work out later. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Ronnie for Act Two. Alrighty, guys, let's get more serious. Are we ready? Yes. Your four favorite foods or type of foods, Luisa. Um, Italian, Japanese. Um, what else do I like to eat? Um, I I like to eat ice cream. <laughs> I mm. like to eat. Um, this is still related. I like to eat gelato. <laughs> that's still a light. They're and different. It's more fat. That's, that's like, yeah. Everything is like icy. All right. Was that for? <laughs> dim, that was dim sum. Dim sum and burgers for me. Ooh. That's enough. Nice, nice. All right. All right. So family recipes. Uh, what family recipes do you got that just better than anyone else? <laughs> I'm going to laugh at this one only because um, little secret. My mom is not a good cook. <laughs> oh, this is my going in public. Not either. Oh, this is okay. Bye, Your mom. mom's not watching. She doesn't even know how to use YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> We'll just hide behind that, yeah. It's okay. um, so Baldwin, yours. you have a better answer because your mom actually had cooked stuff that you liked. <laughs> oh yeah, I love my mom's cooking. But my favorite recipe is that I have no recipe. I just like digging stuff out. I find things and I just create new stuff from whatever whatever I have. So, I call him the king of leftovers. Nice. Good That's answer. that is that is really good. I'm 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 so the recipe I'm so of no recipe. It's like the 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 art of you know <laughs> of being be like water just whatever oh the art of it. fighting without fighting the, there you go the recipe you without go. recipes <laughs> alrighty y'all choose choose one corned beef spam or Vienna sausage Vienna spam. sausage ooh what? that's mm -mm. we're gonna have to work this that is out not the newly this is not the newlywed game for those of you <laughs> old enough to know what I the do have spam game in the is. fridge though right now <laughs> <laughs> all right so balut Filipino delicacy. Oh no, yes, I'm uh, not touching that with a 10 foot pole. I'm trying to be a vegetarian and being getting balut would just be like. That's that anti vegetarian. Would, but of course, I'm not doing a good job at being a vegetarian. So, okay, yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he eats Great chicken soul. feet. He loves chicken feet. So, of course, he can. Yeah. Chicken, chicken I'm just not sure. Core. I heard that sometimes there's feathers in it. So, I'm just not sure. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's, that is not a lie. That is no not thanks. a lie. Yeah. And like if you can get it pre-feathered, I don't know if it matters. <laughs> they'll, they'll figure out the technology sometime in the future. Okay. Um, okay, so your favorite Asian dessert. Ooh, there's this, there's this Shanghainese, um, it's like a red bean, like cake. I can't even explain it. It's this, it's kind of like a crepe, like a red bean crepe. It's the best way to explain it. But that's one of my favorite desserts that very, very few restaurants actually. And I'm, I'm half Shanghainese, so it's, it's a Shanghainese thing. I, I like those mango spongy cakes that you see at the Chinese bakeries that has like a little pineapple on the top too. 
like, like there's like a really thin like circle pineapple but it's actually like a mango topping on top i have i both have a very vague idea of what you both are talking about i'll <laughs> um, take it i'll take it yes 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 okay well your favorite non-asian desserts profiterole it's a french dessert it's a cream puff with ice cream inside mm. very good I, I again you see this theme with ice cream coming through <laughs> anything chocolatey yum Speaking hey, wait, of can which, I can I interrupt, Ronnie? Since uh-huh. since Larissa loves ice cream and LA is a great place for ice cream, favorite really place is. to get favorite place to get ice cream in Los Angeles. Oh my gosh, that's a that's a really good one. You know, there's a place in there's a place in, there's a place in Pasadena called Carmela's that does like homemade ice cream, really good. Well, you know, my first job ever was at Baskin Robbins, so I still <laughs> go to Baskin Robbins. Um, Fair enough. Fair for enough. a while, I thought that would be my career. <laughs> When I was 17, I was like, I'm going to be here forever. <laughs> From scooping life. ice cream to documentary producer. Yeah. <laughs> come a we long way, it. baby. <laughs> I know. there's a, That's a come up right there. All right. <laughs> so uh, we'll have Baldwin take this first. Uh, well, no, sorry. Um, do you, Boba, are we fans? And do we oh, have favorites? I do like Boba. Uh, I, like, I like the passion fruit mixed with lychee with a really hot, soft Boba. You are that customer, Larissa. <laughs> Um, love boba and I like a rose milk tea boba. Mm, I'm with you. I love I love hearing people's boba orders. Okay, and uh, <laughs> all right. So we so Baldwin, you're the cho- chocolate person here. What's your like? What's the gold standard of chocolate for you? Oh, gold standard. Oh, Ghirardelli's, San Francisco, Bay Area. Yeah, oh. area, Larissa. You know what? I just like a good uh, souf- chocolate souffle every once in a while. Ooh, classy. Favorite fruit? Mango. Yeah, same. Ooh, okay, okay. Uh, alcoholic beverage. I'm allergic to alcohol, but I do every once in a while I can take a few sips of Dom Perignon, which is expensive champagne, of course. <laughs> Très classe. My, my favorite alcohol right now is hand sanitizer because I use it so much. <laughs> topical, topical. All right, guys, let's get personal. Uh, you can both answer in on these. It's going to be about your house. Do you have plastic wrapped around your remote control or anything at the house? Not at no. our place, no. no. My right. parents Definitely did growing up. <laughs> <laughs> Always. See, and the parents still do. I think Always you've cut parent. off on this generation. All right. Yes. Um, so, rec- so if we can recommend one um, Asian American book, movie, TV show. Hmm. How about, um, well, book, um, I'm going to say our friend Jane Hong's book, Opening the Gates to Asia, um, only because Baldwin's family is featured in the first chapter. But it also talks about the ex- Chinese Exclusion Act and the impact, not just on the Chinese families, but different Asian families in America. And it's kind of road to repeal. Nice. Uh, are, you, are you talking about old or new? Or does not matter? Anything. Okay. Well, my favorite movie of all time, I got to give props to, of course, Bruce Lee. So Enter the Dragon and Return of the Dragon. But... Since we're on a Filipino show, uh, one of my favorite shows growing up was Sidekicks. Do you remember that on Disney? Ernie Reyes Jr. Oh teaming up with Buck gosh. Rogers. Ernie Reyes was like a little kid, and he was like beating up all the bad guys alongside with Buck Rogers, who was, who was playing a cop. It was this like is, on Disney. This is a deep cut. I am yes. so excited. I am so excited. All right, cool. Uh, let's play Mahjong. How good are you Woo-hoo. guys? Uh, my grandpa good. taught me when I was seven, so Ooh. I'm pretty good. I think she's the first person who yeah. said she was good. I'm nice. just, Thank you. I'm Pretty just, good. I'm just good I, enough to like lose. <laughs> okay, Larissa, I'm calling you up when the pandemic's over and let's play. I would let's love to do play. it. Do you play 13 <laughs> card or 16 card or what Ooh. version do you play? Oh, I play 16. 16, okay. Ooh. I can do both. So let's, we're throwing it down. My <laughs> money's on Larissa. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so have have any either of you been ever been stood up on a date? Not stood up. Oh, I almost stood him up at the aisle. <laughs> yes, you did. I was like, where is she? She's not yeah, showing unintention- up. Unintentionally, there was a whole mix up with my ride to the church to the church where we got married. And I was oh sitting, I was at the hotel after I got my hair and makeup done. And I was basically waiting for somebody to come pick me up to take me back to the church. And there was traffic. <laughs> And I'm oh just imagining God. her standing in the parking lot all alone, holding her dress. And like, <laughs> no, the dress actually left with a friend, oh, right, but I right. was like in hair and makeup and just like a regular t-shirt and like sweats waiting for like my ride to go to the church. I love it. <laughs> like, I hope he doesn't think I'm calling this off. Oh my me, God. Me and my groomsmen were getting ready to go back down to Mexico <laughs> <laughs> and have the party regardless. <laughs> oh, nice. He had a bachelor party there. That's why. 
<laughs> nice. It's like, turn this bus around. All right. Have either of you ever dumped somebody? Yes. Uh, yeah. Ooh, okay. So. Obviously not each other. So that works. Um, <laughs> all right. So we'll start with Larissa first. Look directly into the camera and say one sentence to your haters. Hey, haters out there. I still love you. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was almost going to say the same thing. I was going to say, I love you, but not that much. <laughs> it's all in love. I think that's what the big takeaway is. All love. love. All righty. Uh, and I think we'll have uh, Ed close it out. Okay. Uh, so you both get to be guest hosts for Rise and Shine. You're taking over Ronnie and Ed's spots today. Who would you want to be the guest, dead or alive? I don't know if Baldwin's going to say the same answer. I'd love to interview Jeremy Lin because uh, as a major NBA fan, um, I would really love to talk to him about everything that he's gone through. And we've got some mutual friends. And so, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just going to have to say Bruce Lee because I'm, I'm a huge Bruce Lee fan. What's, and, I, and one of the questions I would ask him is, why is it taking so long for somebody to replace you? Why, why, are, why are you still the most iconic person and you've been dead for so long? Mm. All right. All right. Well, uh, we want to thank uh, Larissa and Baldwin for being guests on 13 Things. Uh, please, please uh, don't forget to uh, download us or where you listen to your favorite podcast or to subscribe to us on a YouTube channel. And you've just been watching 13 Things with Baldwin Chu and Larissa Lamb. And don't forget, if you loved this program, which I know you did, or if you like all the great episodes we've done of Verizon Shine or the great panels and other events that we've done, please consider dropping a few dollars to us on Venmo. We're at Philam Creative. That's on Venmo at Philam Creative. Or you can email us at philamcreative at gmail.com and ask how you can donate to us. I think Kami, shout out to Kami, will be the one to answer that email. But we got to close with our main event. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Baldwin, for coming out today. One more time, can you let our viewers know where can we learn about or watch your film? You can go to uh, pbs.com or worldchannel.org until June 3rd and stream it on demand online. And you can also go to fareastdeepsouth.com to find out about future events and screenings about our film. Um, just also want to say that if you like podcasts, we also host a podcast called Love, Discovery, and Dim Sum, where we talk about issues of race and culture through an Asian American lens and drop in some history too. So um, feel free to check those out. And of course, follow us on social media. The film is at Far East Deep South on Instagram at Far East Deep So on Twitter, and you can find our handles on those pages as well. So we look forward to connecting with you beyond here. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming out today. I feel like we should have done a double episode and had you do another, a, another interview segment where you talk about your podcast and your music careers. So please, please come back again. We would love for you uh, to be guests in the future, Baldwin and Larissa. And, you know, uh, we've been giving shout outs all day. Ronnie and I need to give one very special shout out to our very good friend, a friend of Film Creative, Mr. Leo Partible. Oh, who yeah. hooked us up. Leo. We love you, Larissa Leo. and Baldwin, thank you so much for connecting us. His name and, is in the credits. Uh, <laughs> his name is in the credits. <laughs> and that's right. His name is in the credits. So Let's we are so put his name so in our grateful. credits, too. Just and he's in our episode. credits, yeah. <laughs> so thank you to Leo. Thank you to everyone. And again, our love to Kami and Rex, who weren't with us live in the studio today, but we're grateful that they were here. So on behalf of Rex and Kami and the fabulous Ronnie, this has been a presentation with Larissa and Baldwin. Thank you for watching this episode of Rise and Shine, and we'll see you next week. Hey everyone, Rex here with Rise and Shine. Did you know there's not one, not two, but three different ways you could check out our weekly Rise and Shine episodes? New episodes drop every Tuesday on our YouTube channel at Rise and Shine FAC. And you can listen to the Rise and Shine podcast as you commute to work or walking your daily steps by downloading Rise and Shine wherever you get your favorite podcast. And lastly, you can always join our live audience tapings on Facebook Live Saturday mornings, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So that's three different ways you could fill up on your Rise and Shine diet every week. So please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube page at Rise and Shine FAC 
and watch new episodes every Tuesday or download us wherever you get your favorite podcast. And thanks again for watching and listening to Rise and Shine. Rise and Shine. Hey guys, it's Ed. Thanks for listening today. And did you guys know that Rise and Shine is part of the Philam Creative Umbrella and that we're a registered nonprofit? And as a nonprofit organization, Philam Creative depends on generous donations from fine folks like you to help us to continue to produce great programming like Rise and Shine. Please consider making a donation to help produce shows like Rise and Shine. Our Venmo is at Philam Creative. That's at Phil Am Creative. And if you don't do Venmo, but you still want to donate a few quid to us, then drop us an email at riseandshinefac at gmail.com. That's riseandshinefac at gmail.com, and we'll help you out. We at Rise and Shine appreciate your generosity. Every dollar helps. Rise and shine. This is Kami. I hope you're enjoying the show. Did you know we have a mailing list? And did you know that you can contact us if you want to say hello to Ed, Rex, Ronnie, Veronica, or even me? Just send us an email at riseandshinefac. That's one word spelled out. Rise and shine FAC at gmail.com. Again, that's rise and shine FAC all spelled out at gmail.com. Join our mailing list so you can be the first to find out about the latest rise and shine news. Hey, Rex here with Rise and Shine. And I want you to do something for me. Help support Rise and Shine by liking, subscribing, and following the show online. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, all under at Rise and Shine FAC. So follow the show on all social media platforms on all one word at Rise and Shine FAC. Thanks again for all the love and support. And tell all your friends about Rise and Shine. Rise and Shine. Hey everyone, this is Ed, and I got a question for you. Did you know that Rise and Shine is only one of the many things produced by Philam Creative? That's right, Philam Creative has been producing great stuff, like Rise and Shine, for over 10 years. If you want to learn more about the premier Filipino-American organization that has been the number one advocate for the Asian-American entertainment community for over a decade, then visit our website at philamcreative.org. That's philamcreative.org. Learn more about the organization that produces your favorite show, Rise and Shine. Hi, this is Walter Bohols. I'm proud to be one of the co-founders of Philam Creative and serve as a member of the Board of Directors. In case you didn't know about us, I'd like to share with you our mission statement. Philam Creative Incorporated educates and advocates the Filipino-American entertainment community and all looking for a collaborative workspace in order to achieve greater representation and career advancement. Although we're based in Southern California, Philam Creative's reach can be felt worldwide. If you're interested in joining us behind the scenes to produce or promote our many programs and initiatives, visit our website at philamcreative.org. That's philamcreative.org. And contact us to learn how you can join our cause. For students, we also have internships available for you to gain valuable experience. Visit us to learn more at philamcreative.org. Rise and shine. Hey guys, it's Ed. Thanks for listening today. And did you guys know that Rise and Shine is part of the Philam Creative umbrella and that we're a registered nonprofit? 
And as a nonprofit organization, Philam Creative depends on generous donations from fine folks like you to help us to continue to produce great programming like Rise and Shine. Please consider making a donation to help produce shows like Rise and Shine. Our Venmo is at Philam Creative. That's at Philam Creative. And if you don't do Venmo, but you still want to donate a few quid to us, then drop us an email at riseandshinefac at gmail.com. That's riseandshinefac at gmail.com, and we'll help you out. We at Rise and Shine appreciate your generosity. Every dollar helps. Rise and Shine. Hey guys, Ronnie here. I know my sister Veronica likes to mess with the crew, but we all really work hard to produce a quality program for you. Rise and Shine is produced by Philam Creative in association with RAS Music Group and Millennius LLC. Rise and Shine is written, created, produced, and hosted by Ed Malillan and Rex Sampaga. It also features Veronica Cagneso, Kami Koyamko, and me, Ronnie Cagneso. I'm also our show's stage director, which isn't easy when you gotta keep Ed and Rex in check. And finally, our amazing technical director is Jeremiah Castro. Thanks for tuning in every week to Philam Creative's number one show, Rise and Shine. <laughs>